Welcome to Ignite Your Confidence for women in leadership who want to speak up and stand out. I'm your host, Karen Laus. Here you'll get all of the tips and tools that you need to stand out with unshakable confidence. Let's dive into today's episode. Okay, folks. Well, we have a wonderful guest today, Sonia. I want to turn it over to you right away and tell us about yourself. Well, thanks, Karen. It's great to be here. I am a coach, a speaker, and an author, and I've been living my life's work uh, supporting people that for 27 years. So my, my passion and my specialty is to help purpose-driven people to receive the fulfillment they've been working so hard for. And so I really love to illuminate that while, yes, success is, you know, there's a lot of ways to achieve success. It doesn't always guarantee fulfillment. And I, in particular, have discovered after 27 years that um, by working with high performing, high achieving, ambitious people, we tend to have a unique set of behaviors and blind spots that are the cause of our upper limits. And one of those causes of our upper limits is that we've put so much faith in the hard work ethic that we don't realize it can only take us so far. And so I love illuminating not just the doing skills that hard workers are really good at, but the being skills that tend to be malnourished and sometimes absent and that that can really open up those upper limits and make fulfillment possible. Oh my gosh. That's so great. I love what you do. That word malnourished, that's intense talking about <laughs> people. And I would love for you to talk a little bit more about that because there are so many people, especially that listen to my podcast that are overachievers. And I know for me, it was, I grew up as a kid that you were recognized for accomplishments and it took me a long time as an adult to realize, oh, I'm actually valuable just because of who I am. So yeah. that was a big insight. And I know that's been an insight for people I've worked with. So I'd, I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, that that's a, a great introduction, a great segue. So I kind of joke that the first 25 years of my life, I was trying to find happiness based on what I call instinct, you know? So, and I joke that I was raised as the eldest male. So my father got a scholarship from uh, Argentina to MIT to get his master's in electrical engineering. He and my mother lived apart for two years and four months. Then she came over after they got married by proxy. I was a first generation American, but he really was kind of the dominant parent in my life. It just kind of worked out that way, sort of culturally. And I got this great message that I could do and be anything I wanted to. Um, but it was really what you talked about. I developed my sense of value, my sense of worthiness, like so many people, especially in our country, um, that is based on what you do and what you achieve. And so by the age of 24, I graduated with a business degree in finance. Um, I was trading stocks and bonds at a brokerage firm, an institutional brokerage firm in Boston. I was an assistant vice president at the age of uh, 24, and I had achieved all of this outer world success, making good money, wow. but I was dying a spiritual death. I mean, I was just, I was suffering from bulimia. I was really unhealthy, a lot of self-loathing, but it was the first time in my life that I felt like I had permission to ask. And I remember this moment in the trading room floor and I'm thinking, well, I did everything I was supposed to do. I got the college degree. I got the good grades. I got the job. I got the money. I got the position. What do I want to be when I grow up? And it was the first time I didn't have a box I had to check off to please or, you know, fulfill my duty as a daughter. <laughs> and that's when I found myself exploring what I call the invisible world. And that was the world of the inside, not just the external world of success or achievement. And it was just this uncharted territory. And so um, I dove deep and kind of the next 25 years and beyond were all about the invisible world and consciousness and, and the inner world and how to heal from an eating disorder. Well, it's really not about food in your body. It's about feelings. So I learned about my feelings and that opened up my intuition and all kinds of personal growth work that ultimately led me into leadership and into an inter international women's organization. And they were the ones who really believed in me and said, you know, Sonia, you got something here. Um, do that workshop you've been dreaming about. So my business started in 90, 
95, 1995, with, I created what's called the vision workshop. And it was about learning how to manifest the relationship of your dreams. And then that grew into more and more. And I wrote my book and my business grew. So that's where I have come to where I stand today, where I really talk about the doing skills and the being skills and a sense of value that comes from what you're able to conceive of with your own mind and your own actions and left to your own devices versus what you're able to invite from life, letting life be the provider instead of you being the sole provider. And so that was kind of the birth of, of this, this, this conversation we're having. Yeah. That's, that's so fantastic. That's pretty incredible about all that you achieved. And then to realize the internal world was just not like you weren't fulfilled. I mean, that, that, I feel like that describes so many people that we can look great on the outside or look, you know, and even almost not to put this in your, (laughs) I I don't want to make assumptions about you, but I know certainly a lot of times we look like we're, we have it all together and we might even try to fake as if we have it all together, but we really know inside that we don't. And that that's also what I really love about the recent in the past few years focus on mental health and bringing a lot of these mental health challenges to light and mm-hmm. recognizing these things actually affect performance and, and all of that. So I, I just think what you're doing is fantastic. And I love the title of your book. Tell us about your book. It's pretty about. So- the the book is I published that actually it's been a while now 2008 is when that came out and that was the attraction distraction why the law of attraction isn't working for you and how to get results finally <clears throat> and so I wrote the book that I wished I'd had on my journey I studied like I said the invisible world and manifestation and consciousness and and all of that but it was interesting I just kept bumping up against these information gaps and also what seemed to be like these distortions of understanding and finally when my understanding and my you know I was able to actually produce concrete results and my clients were too the book started to come out at the same time as the secret and um, what the bleep do we know it was kind of like the, the sort of you know this this synchronistic timing um and it did really well and I think the reason it did well and then it was translated into five languages was it was answering the questions that people were having which is I'm saying the affirmations I'm visualizing I'm doing my vision boards why isn't this working you know and that was the piece that I was really curious about I didn't just want to like do techniques do do techniques but like what's really happening in the inner world what is the cause of the effect in our lives what's happening in consciousness so I used to say that I like to look under the hood, like what's really going on? How does this work? Mm -hmm. Um, And so, yeah, that was, that was the point of that whole book. And then most recently I've taken just a piece of that and really opened up, which is my passion now is I teach what I like to think is the one skill most hardworking people are missing, which is how to receive. Oh, because I really, I really, that's, you know, when you're in hunter mode and you're a doer, you know how to hunt, you know how to want, you know how to seek. I, I used to call myself the relentless seeker. But the truth is that we already are all that we seek to be, do, and have. I presuppose wholeness. I presuppose that life is whole. It's all here. But if we don't know how to receive, our consciousness is always seeking. And when you're seeking, you're presupposing what's under the hood is I'm seeking something because I don't have it. We're operating from lack before we even get started. But if you assume it's all here, how do I receive it? It's a completely different question. So I actually released the receive Oracle cards last year with all of the teaching principles about how to receive. Oh, wow. How fabulous. Congratulations. Thank you. I, I think it's amazing how, I mean, that boy, that really is spot on about the receiving piece, how hard it is, especially for leaders and especially as women, you know, we're doing everything for everybody else. And it makes me think about too, how hard it is for people to ask for what they need and the vulnerability that that brings up and the ownership, you know, where you have to actually say, I need this. And would you, <laughs> would you give that to me? I, I think all of that is so powerful. 
Well, I'm curious if we think back to when you started out, what, uh, like, first of all, did you ever think that you would be doing this? Um, I don't know that I thought I would be doing it, but I know I wanted to. Uh, my, there was this running joke, uh, you know, and I don't know how, what age range your audience is, but um, I'm going to be 59 this December. And so oh. back when I was a kid, there was this famous advice columnist, Dear Abby. Yes. And so I was just far over 40, by the okay. way. So hopefully people know who I'm talking about, but she was this famous <laughs> advice columnist. And um, so she was always giving advice in the newspapers and things like that. And in second, when I was little, I was quite the chatterbox. And so the my second grade teacher told my mom, um, you know, Sonia just is always giving people advice. She's a regular dear Abby. <laughs> <laughs> So we moved it to the boys table because she's just talking too much. So I, kept talk, I kept talking. And um, then later on in life, I started doing those personality assessments because I, you know, I wasn't happy trading stocks and bonds. And it always came back, teacher, leader, counselor, teacher. Uh... I did. I dreamt of being a counselor um, mm. and helping people. And so when I left the brokerage firm, I went and I got my master's in social work and I kind of blended running businesses, but also being of service um, to, and then found a way to do my own thing. So it was, I don't know if I thought I'd be doing it, but I had the dream of at least being a counselor. And I did, I, I started, I started my own practice part-time in 99 and then it just grew from there. Wow. That's, that's amazing. And boy, let me tell you, I have a strong connection to the Dear Abby call. Ah. <laughs> Even if nobody else can connect with this, I certainly can. Yeah, I always wanted to be her. <laughs> so yeah. that, that is really fun about that. Well, one of the things that is in my mind, I feel like a story loop was opened and I would love to have it closed okay. <laughs> around your book and just and in general, the whole concept of the law of attraction. So why don't vision boards work or what, what are we missing? Like, in other words, give us some tips. What oh. do we need to do if the vision boards aren't working or the affirmations aren't working? What's the, what's the solution? Okay. Well, in 2008, when I released the book, what I, the way I formulated everything that I wanted to offer was through something called the mystics formula. So it was a formula that, that organized the ideas. So there were a lot of teachers out there, Abraham Hicks and other ones, which is think it, believe it, receive it, you know, those kinds of three-step processes. And so the mystics formula addressed those three, which was identify what you want. Um, gosh, I can't even remember because I don't teach it this way anymore, but there was a third <laughs> Step, there was a third step, which was really the heart of the book. And that was get out of your own way. Ooh. And so th the reason these techniques, tools and techniques don't, um, are, are not consistently effective is because there's a lot of myths and misunderstandings built into, it isn't necessarily the teachings. I just felt that the teachings were incomplete. And again, again, I, I wanted to illuminate the information gaps and the, the distortions so one of the main concepts that a lot of people misunderstand, first of all, they look at law of attraction and these techniques as something you do. It's still through the doing lens. Oh. Now, what's under the hood, what's happening when you're approaching spiritual or energetic teachers teachings through this doing lens is there's a deeper level of consciousness that we're not aware of that's actually creating our conscious, our, our reality. So that is, if I do, an, if I say an affirmation, enough affirmations, then I'm going to do it right, right? And then I'll get the thing, mm -hmm. right? But it's setting up, what it is, is you're believing that there's a right and a wrong way. There you're also believing that you're the one who's making this happen, Right. And you're also focusing on the wrong thing. So what, what a lot of us focus on when we're saying affirmations and all of that is the thing, the what, the world of form, okay? But what I like to offer is that for any goal we ever have, any desire, it doesn't matter what it is, there's only one reason. We're chasing a feeling that we can't connect with any other way. We think we're missing the feeling. I need the house in order to feel security. 
I need or want the relationship in order to feel love. I want to lose weight in order to feel beautiful, enough, attractive, whatever it is. Yeah. So we're focusing on the wrong thing. And if you focus on the wrong thing, you're going to get more of the wrong thing. You're going to get more of everything that you believe is not here yet until you get the thing. It just creates distance and waiting and frustration. But when we focus instead on the feelings that we think that thing will give us, then we're starting to put ourselves on the right track. And so it's about getting out of our own way first by learning to focus on what we, I always say ultimate manifestation occurs when you focus on what you really want, not what you think you want. So that's, that's say that enough. again. Will you say that again? Yes. Ultimate manifestation occurs when you focus on what you really want, not the, what you think you want. So we think we want the thing Mm -hmm. But what we really want is the feeling we think we'll feel when we get the thing. <laughs> so good. Yeah. So that's, that's a core one. And then the other that's really like mind blowing is we don't manifest what we want. What we actually manifest into our experience is how we relate to ourselves how we relate to the thing we want. So for example, we want money, right? Yeah. If you relate to money from a place of gratitude and appreciation, and oh my gosh, there's, there's always more where that came from, you're going to have that experience with money. If you relate to money, like there's never enough, literally, I have clients who have eight figure net worths. They have the same problems as, as people who who are really truly like aren't making enough money because their consciousness is never enough. There are gorgeous, physically gorgeous human beings on this planet. They have the appearance that many people want. They are not happy with themselves. It doesn't, it's never enough. It's not the thing. It's not the form. But if you relate to the thing or you relate to yourself with love, with compassion, with gentleness, instead of trying to change when you feel bad and fix yourself, you focus instead on nurturing and soothing, then life rises up to meet you in nurturing and soothing ways. When you value your needs and wants, even if you're vulnerable, even if there's something you're struggling with, if you're really bringing love and nurturing into it, then life rises up to meet you and you experience life as loving and valuing your needs and valuing your wants and being available to you when you're available to you. So the overarching idea is most of us are just focused on the wrong thing. Our consciousness is still creating our reality, but we don't really realize how it's working underneath all those techniques. I love this. <laughs> this is fantastic. And you work with people one-on-one -on -one as well, right? Yeah. Because I want to make sure that people hear this and can call on you to potentially really fix, well, I shouldn't say fix, but change their lives for the better. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Fix might be the right word for some of us. Who knows? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but in thinking about your life and your confidence journey, did you, can you bring us into a moment or a time where you felt like, wow, I am good at this. I'm mm. confident. Maybe either when you felt like, oh, I've arrived or maybe just over a period of time you went, yeah. I, I really do this well. You know, the, you know the, the thing that stood out for me when you asked me that question was, and I can't remember the, where I was, but I remember the thought. And that was when I really, no kidding, accepted my humanity. <gasps> like I stopped trying to do it perfectly. And once I, I really somehow relaxed into I'm human, we're all human. There is no perfect. There's no such thing. Mm -hmm. And with that, I thought about the leaders that I wanted to emulate, like who were my role models? Mm -hmm. Because I had lots of teachers and they were, you know, whether they had a stage or whether they were facilitating events for 250 people. And it wasn't, it's funny, you and I were talking about TED Talks, right? Earlier, yeah. TED Talks conversational styles. And I realized, you know, my problem with a TED talk is I would be so bound up with doing it perfectly because I had to fit into 18 minutes. So I couldn't do it, but it was the ones who shared their personal stories 
the ones who shared about their challenges and how they overcame it, those were the ones that engendered trust in me immediately. Because if they they told me about how good they were or they looked perfect, I'm like, I don't know if I can trust them because I don't know if they've walked in my shoes. And so when I did that with myself, and then I realized, oh, I'm giving myself permission to be real and authentic with myself. That's what I value in leaders that I admire. That I'm like, I think I can do, I think I'm good at this. I think I, I think I can just be me. <laughs> it's kind of like, <laughs> if I can be me, you know, it's like it works. You know, it was like I just stopped. And it's funny because one of the, the things I came up with for one of my, my more recent courses, it's called the Focus and Flourish program. Um, was that this is a place where the participants have an opportunity to discover how their presence is more powerful than their productivity. Oh, that's beautiful. And it's about that. It's about, and that's also at the heart of imposter syndrome. You know, imposter syndrome comes from thinking I need to somehow perform well enough yeah. that, and this is arbitrary standard of enoughness, but until you really get to like, your presence is really what allows you to embody your power. And if you don't address that back to the being world, which gets malnourished versus the doing world, there's always going to be this place of, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. You know, I can't do this because I have to look like somebody else or perform like some or produce or something like that. It's very externalized and it's very achievement doing oriented rather than presence and who you be. Yeah. My goodness. I mean, this is so rich. It's just fascinating. And isn't it ironic that, because <laughs> I resonate a lot, what resonates for me a lot is just the part about being yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's the same thing that I, ultimately my mission is to help women be free of all these things that get in the way, like self-doubt and you know, people pleasing and all these things that just hinder us from truly being our most wonderful selves. And it's amazing how easy it sounds and yet how hard it is just with the way all the cultural mores that we have and the way we were raised. And oh my gosh, there's just so many things. I love that reminder of accepting your own humanity. It's mm. fantastic. <laughs> what else? Let's let's think about how about a time when you made a mistake and how you recovered from it? What can we learn in the spirit of what you just shared? I actually think that's really good, <laughs> good timing, right? <laughs> because yeah. I'm also a, like, I call myself a recovering perfectionist and being mm -hmm. able to accept that it's okay. You know, done is better than perfect. And in fact, <laughs> it's the chasing perfection thing that we're never going to actually arrive anyway. Right, right. Yeah, boy, that myth of arrival. I have a coach that I worked with and she used to talk about good is good enough. So when I surrendered to that, I got a lot more momentum going because I too am a recovering perfectionist for sure. Um, you know, it's funny, mistakes, my mistake that I made, there's not like one, there's a recurring theme though <laughs> that I noticed. Hey, yeah, tell us. And, and the biggest one, it, it, that well, the one that comes to mind, you know, cause we're human and we all make mistakes. Oh. is um but specifically in my business where i would accommodate people mm. and you know the the funny so it would look like you know when i first started out in business you know i wasn't confident it was something oh my gosh i remember so I, one of the things i integrated into my coaching practice was energy healing because it was something that really had a positive impact in my life. And I remember when I started introducing it with my clients, I said, look, I'm learning this new thing. You want to try it? And I remember they say, okay. And I would do it. And I'd literally be sweating while I'm doing this energy healing. Oh, was, really? I was like, oh my gosh, is this something, is this working? Am I doing okay? <laughs> but um, so when I first started, I didn't feel confident and certainly charging money was really hard, you know? And I remember my first friend who believed in me, she goes right off the bat, she goes, you need to raise your rates. I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't know if I could do that, you know? So, and as I started learning how to run my own business, um, I did a lot of things like, I think a lot of people do when they're not feeling confident, which is I would accept all kinds of clients, whether I liked them or not, whether yeah. I thought they were aligned with what I was here to offer, um, I would discount my rates. I'd let people tell me that's too much. And, you know, so yeah. I would do a lot of accommodating and 
that mistake, that's the mistake. It's what the, what the underlying mistake was. I didn't know what my value was and I didn't know how to stand in my value. And every time I'd make a mistake, it would be something like I would have, you know, a, like I remember one, for example, uh, this man who was just pushing back on my rates or my this or my that. And he like, I was just, I was such a Gumby. I was so flexible about my, you know, like, let me just yeah. print this for you. Anyway, <laughs> I finally gave him what he wanted. And then he didn't show up to oh. the sessions. He kept rescheduling and then he just changed his mind. Now, luckily I had a, a client document, an agreement that he had signed. He started bullying me because I wouldn't give him his money back. And in the past, I would have. That's the thing. It's like I kept growing. Oh, yeah. So I went to my friend and I said, "How do I handle this?" And I, you know, I'm a, I'm a peacemaker. I'm a social worker. I'm a counselor. I don't want. <laughs> I don't like conflict, right? But I knew that I couldn't continue to grow in in what I, my vision of how I wanted to help people if I didn't put on my big girl panties and learn how to stand for my value. So she helped me, you know, craft a letter and sometimes I'd recover by saying, okay, I screwed up. It's going to cost me. I can absorb that loss. And my recovery was, and I reclaim my power by saying right now, I agree to never do that again. I will never sell myself out. And another thing that I did was I embraced the feeling of resentment. And I realized every time I feel resentful, it means I am not valuing myself and I need to up my standards. And so I always joke to, when I tell people about my policies and procedures, I go, every policy and procedure I have came from feeling resentful because I didn't have something like this before. And it, would give birth, it kind of gave birth to the business structure and the way I do business and standards and expectations. And so they were, they were always painful lessons, but I always learned something from it. And as long as I integrated what I learned, I felt like it was a good recovery. That's beautiful because that's how we learn, right? right? And I'm so there with you. I mean, I remember, especially even during COVID, I remember my husband, sometimes he'd overhear glint little things and he goes, you know, and this was, thankfully this was at the beginning and I quickly realized I got to do what I'm teaching my people to do. Where I realized he goes, you know, it just, you're always accommodating people just, and Anyway, I don't want to say too much here and take anything <laughs> away from you, but it, I, let me just say, I connect with exactly what you're talking about. And isn't it powerful to be able to look back and go, I'm not doing that anymore. Or I, I don't do that anymore. Yes. So thank you for your vulnerability around that, because I think you're, you're, um, you're in good company here <laughs> with a lot of people that can relate to that. And I love what, that your friend challenged you to raise your rates. That's yeah. <laughs> So good. Well, what else, what have I not asked you that you'd like me to ask or share before we wrap up? <sighs> Let's see. Well, I'd love to just share that, that one skill that I teach hardworking people, what, what they're missing. I call it the skill of receiving. And so um, it's really been in the last five to 10 years that that came into clarity. And so I teach a three-step receive method and, um, and, and, I don't know how much time we have, but basically I, I like to say that I became a disciple of the tree, the majestic tree. Ooh, yeah, tell so, us. I, I, so the story goes like this. Um, you know, I've studied, I've studied doing and being in all of these realms for a while, but I was having a moment quite a few years ago where I'm sitting at my desk and I'm clearly working too hard. You know, again, we, I remember I had a coach who said, you know, your ideal client is a version of you. So that's why I speak to people who work too hard, right? <laughs> Yes. And, but in this particular moment, I, that higher wisdom came in and said, Sonia, you know better. You are working too hard. You've got to stop all this doing and be. But for, the, for some reason, this time, I heard an additional piece of awareness. And I was like, but if I don't do, nothing's going to happen. So, what is the power of being here? What is the value and the power of being? And I had a couple more awarenesses, which were the stopping doing, the absence of doing does not equal the power of being. 
And what happens is, is when we're indoctrinated into my values and what I do, my values and my productivity, it's literally like an internalized bias. We see everything as either doing or not doing. So when you're in doing mode and you look at being, you don't see the power of being. What you see is passive, lazy, inactive, weak. You know, you don't see that the power of this. So then my next question is, what is the value and the power of being? Because not doing isn't enough. What is this piece that I'm missing? Mm. And I got this vision of the tree and I realized, oh my gosh, the tree is a living being. Like we are human beings and it does nothing, examines nothing, hunts nothing, pursues nothing. And it receives all day long from life itself, everything it needs. If it wants everything, probably much of what it wants, it's just standing here. And it receives everything from life. And not only that, its impact and its influence in the world is by being, is its presence. It grows, the bees come, the butterflies, the people, the people are impacted. Its seeds are spread across the land. It doesn't go selling the seeds. The winds <laughs> blow it around there for, and it just occupies the lands and it has its presence there. And I uh, like to say that from that day forward, I became a disciple of the tree. And I've, my, everything that I teach is, okay, how does that translate to being human and being powerful? How does that translate to manifesting? How does that translate to how do I be in order to receive, you know? So, so that's the skill that I teach and it's wow. kind of distilled into this three-step method that's, you know, I've been doing it now for quite a few years and the results that people get is incredible. That's I mean, amazing. I had to teach it a few times to really trust that it wasn't a fluke and that it really works and it does. Yeah. So can you recap the one, two, three for us? Yes. So the, I use an acronym, which is A L I. So the first thing to understand is that the key to all receiving is awareness. We work in consciousness. So where the hunter uses mind for the thinking, the beer, the tree, the human being uses the mind for awareness. So we shift from thinking to awareness. So the three-step process is A-L-I, which stands for awareness, let it be here, invite more or better. Ooh. And it's incredible. It, you know, it's a little unfamiliar. It's not difficult. It's incredibly simple because, hey, we're human beings. It's natural to us. We're just disconnected from it. But when you learn how to apply that, then again, you shift from trying to figure it out and do it all yourself, which makes you the singular sole provider of everything you want to manifest to you embodying this awareness, receiving all that life gives you. I like to say unselectively like the tree instead of selectively like the hunter. You're unselective. You can receive much more than you could do on your own. Um, So it's very simple. It's like one inch wide and 10 million miles deep in terms of how it can impact people's lives and connect them to their power. That is so fabulous. And I love that you talked about that you had the vision. I mean, I feel like that's just divine. So that's fantastic. (laughs) Well, I feel like I could talk to you all day about this. I love everything you represent. So please tell us where we can reach you. Well, thank you, Karen. I I appreciate this opportunity and I appreciate so much what you're doing because yeah, when I learned about your podcast, I'm like, oh yeah, we're like on the same page for sure. (laughs) Um, so my website is a great place to go, which is surpassyourlimits.com. And you can contact me there, um, explore. And if anyone's interested in learning the three-step receive method, I have a guide. So you can go to the receive method.com and it's a little 21 page guide and it kind of illuminates how to do this. Awesome. That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much. It's such a delight to spend some time with you. Thank you, Karen. It's been a real joy. And that's a wrap of another episode of Ignite Your Confidence. I'm your host, Karen Laus. Thank you so much for listening. If you love today's episode, please subscribe and leave a review. It helps other people find the podcast faster, and it certainly helps me. If you're interested in more tips and tools around confidence, please join me over in my Facebook group called Ignite Your Confidence with Karen Laus. Remember, you too can stand out with unshakable confidence. <laughs>